Welcome to Grace Family Church. You can make a difference by getting involved in our Painting Day mission coming up. There's a night mission happening too, so sign up online to be part of the team. Buckets of Hope are on sale from today as part of the Matthew 25 Challenge. Check out your brochure or our website for details. You're invited to hear fitness guru Justin Fries' story of recovery from addiction. So save the date now. Kids, you'll have way more fun at Grace Kids. So ask your parents to go check you in now. We want to connect with you on social media. So take down our details and say hi this week. Hey, if you're new here today, we'd love to meet you. Connect with one of our team after the service.
quick to listen and slow to speak. And this morning we have a beautiful invitation to apply that principle to God, to be quick to listen what He wants to say to us today and slow to speak, slow to argue with Him about all the reasons why not, slow to argue with Him about why we think our plan is better than His plan. This morning, let's be quick to listen to what He wants to say to us. So as we sing this song, let's just open our hearts, open our minds, and just say, Holy Spirit, what do you need to do in me today? Because there's nothing worth more that could ever come close. Nothing can compare your living hope. Your prayer.
scripture that says, just do not be afraid, but just stand still and God will fight on your behalf. And I just had a sense coming into this morning that maybe there's someone in this room and you feel like you're up against a wall and maybe you're even in the fight of your life. And this morning you need to know that all you need to do is put God in His rightful place, stand and let Him fight on your behalf. And friends, one of the most powerful ways we can do that is to worship Him. Sometimes there's power in just what comes out of our mouths because we understand who we are singing to and how great He is. So sometimes when we fight, we just gotta sing. So there's this really simple song that we do every now and again. But this morning, if that's you and you're up against a wall, you need to sing this like you have never sung it before because when it looks like we are surrounded, we're surrounded by Him. Let me say it again. When it looks like we are surrounded, we're surrounded by Him. This is how it goes, ready? Because this is how I find my battles. This is how I find my battles. This is how I find my battles. Do you believe it? This is how I find my battles. Hey! This is how I find my battles. to worship, which is great, obviously, also, but it is a special weekend, and it would be a miss for us not to mention repeatedly that we are the world champions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, if you are visiting with us today, we're so glad that you've joined us, and, you know, if you're kind of wondering what kind of church is this, we believe that we're here to love God, love people, and make a difference. And one of the ways that we do that every single year is what you witnessed when you walked in the concourse are those stacks of buckets, buckets of hope, buckets that we fill with food and distribute to people to remind them that they're not alone and that there is a community of people who are thinking of them and praying for them and meeting them where they're at. And this year, what we're doing is we are engaging in a, in a, in a, like a campaign really called the Matthew 25 Challenge. Because making a difference is something God invites each of us to participate in. It's not simply something for us to spectate or hand over to God to do, but it's for every single one of us to engage with. So I just want to read Matthew 25 to you this morning. And it's Jesus speaking to his followers, to a group of people who want to know what is Jesus really about? What is the good news? What is the gospel? What is at the core of it? And this is what Jesus says to them. He says, for I was hungry and you fed me. I was thirsty and you gave me a drink. I was a stranger and you invited me into your home. I was naked and you gave me clothing. I was sick 
and you cared for me. I was in prison and you visited me. And his followers are like, uh, Jesus, did we have like a memory blackout? Like, you know this happened. When did this happen? We don't know that we've ever done these things for you. And then he clarifies for them and he says, no, I tell you the truth. When you did it to one of the least of these, my brothers and sisters, you were doing it to me. You see, Jesus is identifying himself with the poor and the hungry and the needy and the homeless and the lonely. And he's saying, hey guys, if you identify as a Christ follower, then you'll do what I did and you'll identify yourself with these guys. So we're gonna be doing the Matthew 25 challenge. Now, before we do that, we participate in making a difference in ways like this and through giving. So if you give now or online, you can go ahead, you can prepare to do that now. And I'm gonna pray while the team pass the baskets around. Jesus, we're so grateful that we are not just about gathering together and listening and praying and worshiping. And that's such a beautiful part of what it means to follow you. But we're grateful that you invite us to participate in your mission to heal the world, that we get to make a difference with our little, with a lot, with whatever we have. You invite us to do to the least of these what you would do, which is to be with them where they are. And so God, we follow you in this way. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I'm just here as an accessory really today, but um, I just want to say welcome um, on my behalf. And, and just if you, if you are new, if you're visiting, uh, if this is maybe your first time, or maybe you've been coming for a few weeks, you're kind of flying under the radar a little bit, but you want to find out more about Grace or get connected, then I would love to meet with you after the service. Uh, we have a process called Engage, and it starts with Engage One. So come and see me, come say hi. Uh, you can ask questions, and I'll just share with you a little bit about who we are as a church and uh, how you can get involved and be part of what we believe God has called us to um, as a church. Uh, I just also want to tell you a little bit about the Matthew 25 challenge. It's really, really exciting. So every year we do these buckets, and maybe some of you are familiar with that, but we're kind of upping the ante a little bit this year. And so to identify with these people that Jesus speaks about, that Jess just uh, read from the Scriptures, every day of the week, building up to our Thanksgiving Sunday, our Bucket Sunday, where we normally bring our buckets filled with, stu with groceries back, we're also going to be challenging every single one of us as a church to participate in kind of activities throughout the week that connect to the scripture. So for example, when it says you were hungry and you gave me something to eat, that day we're going to invite you to not eat for the whole day, um, that, which is like impossible but for me. But we're going to ask you to do that or fast something. Then maybe when it says I'm thirsty, that day we're going to ask you to go without coffee, to go without, oh, to go without um, a drink. No, no. Is that even biblical? Yeah, no, it's not biblical. I don't know. Um, so, so we're going to kind of every day, um, one of the days is we're going to ask you to, lie, to sleep on, on, on the floor um, in, in identification with those who do not have a bed uh, during the week. And again, these things, they're small things, but they make a huge impact. Um, and, and even as we give, I'm just reminded, even, even as these baskets are going around, it's not about how much we give. It's not about this little you know, contribution that we make. It's actually about what it says on a much bigger level. Mm. I love that when Sia Khaleesi spoke about winning the World Cup, he didn't speak about winning the World Cup. He spoke about giving hope to an entire nation. Um, it's not about a rugby game. It's about uh, what, the, what that represents. And so yeah. even as we give and we participate, we're part of what God is already doing in and around our nation. So we invite you to participate in that. Um, it's going to be a really, really exciting week uh, for Matthew 25. Yeah, so that starts um, later on, and we're going to help you connect with that as we go on. But today we start a brand new series called The Naked Truth. What does it mean to be in relationship with each other, um, to identify as someone who is shameless and selfless and free, with nothing to hide, showing up as our whole selves in our everyday life? And so about two years ago, there was this movie that came out that our family's been mildly obsessed with. My kids know all the songs and dance around the kitchen to them, but it's called The Greatest Showman. And in my opinion, the greatest song from The Greatest Showman is the one that Katie Abiti is going to sing for us now and set us up for a journey we're going to go on together. So, here we go. Let's enjoy this moment together. I just want you to know that this is utterly terrifying for me. your broken parts I've learned to be ashamed of all my scars run away they say no 
wanna love you as you are, but I won't let them break me down to dust. I know that there's a place for us, for all we are glorious. When the sharpest words wanna cut me down, I'm gonna say. This is me. Look out, cause here I come. And I'm marching on to the beat I drum. I'm not scared to be seen. I'll make no apology. This is me. Oh. no matter what their history is, no matter what scars they bear, and no matter what they've been through. When I hear that song, I see somebody who's maybe been misunderstood, who's been hurt by people's words, but has found a way to live free of that. And what a beautiful picture. And really, what we see in the lyrics of the song is the story of all people, of all of us. Because so often, at the root of our relational struggles, at the root of the, the patterns and the cycles that we find ourselves in, at the heart of so much of the pain we might carry and the scars we might carry through life, is this idea of shame. How do we live free of shame? How do we show up and move from being hiding and ashamed of who we are to saying, this is me? How do we go from kind of imploding, lonely selfishness and being wrapped up in a world that feels small and caged in to a world that is wholehearted and selfless? How do we go from living in fear to being free from those shackles? Over the next few weeks, we're doing this series called The Naked Truth. 
the truth about being shameless, the truth about being selfless, and the truth about living free. Because when we strip everything back, when we uncover the layers, when we peel away everything that's going on in our relationships and in our lives, there is either a truth or a lie sitting at the core of that. And that truth or that lie that's at the core of us is what is driving and shaping and informing our day-to-day -day lives. And so today we are looking at the naked truth about shame. Now, shame is not that, oh, shame, England lost. <laughs> and South Africans like to say shame all the time. But the shame that I'm talking about is a different kind of shame to ach shame, okay? Brene Brown, a social researcher who's done over 14 years of data, qualitative driven research into the idea of human relationships, has to said this about shame. This is what she says, shame is the intensely painful feeling or experience of believing that we are flawed and therefore unworthy of love and belonging. Perhaps today you can bring to mind a relationship that's in struggle. Maybe it's from your past. Maybe it's very much part of your day to day. Maybe it's a memory you can't shake. Maybe it's a reality you're looking straight in the eye. But as we journey through this process, won't you think of a relationship that you struggle with right now? Because I believe that if we drill down to what is going on there, there's a good chance we will find a fear or a feeling or a belief that we are unworthy of love and belonging because there's something wrong with us. We are flawed. And shame is an uncomfortable feeling. Maybe you're even feeling it now. Ugh, why are we talking about this stuff in church? Shame is kind of this icky squirm in your seat word. And I want to start off by explaining the difference between shame and guilt. Okay, so guilt is what we feel when we have done something wrong. Guilt is what I feel when I've made a mistake. So for example, hypothetically speaking, guilt is what I would feel if I ate an entire tub of KFC on my own. Okay, I would be like, I did something bad. And then I would probably, this feeling would catalyze me into saying, you know what, I need to go to gym tomorrow and I'm not gonna reward myself with an ice cream afterwards. You see, so often guilt reminds us of what we want to be and says, hey, you haven't been doing that. And it can actually kind of positively motivate us to make some changes. That's guilt. But shame is something completely different. You see, if guilt says, you made a mistake. Shame says, you are a mistake. If guilt says, I did something wrong, shame says, there's something wrong with you. Shame is what I feel if I eat an entire tub of KFC on my own and then feel like an utterly worthless human being. So I just grab the tub of ice cream and smash that too and then say, there's something wrong with me, obviously, so I go to the fridge and I open up and eat a pack of ham, okay? <laughs> That's what shame does. Now, these are obviously hypothetical situations. Um, I have never hit rock bottom like that before. Can you see the difference between guilt and shame? See, shame doesn't motivate you to make changes in your life like guilt might. Shame actually cripples us. It freezes us up. It makes us high who we really are and what we're going through. And if we get down to the bottom of most relational breakdowns, of most addictions, of most patterns and cycles we find ourselves in that are destroying our lives, we usually find shame. Because shame is that little voice that whispers in our heads saying, who do you think you are? Who do you think you are to be loved, to be cared for, to be valued? Shame is that little voice that says, you're not good enough. You'll never be good enough. Shame is that little whisper that says, you know, if they knew, if they really knew, if they found out what you were really like, they wouldn't love you. Shame is a dark, insidious, powerful voice. And it's not just something we find in psychological theory or in research. 
it shows up in the first two chapters of Scripture. We find the story of shame right at the beginning of the Bible. And so I want to take us through some of this beautiful Hebrew poetry that we find in Genesis 1 and 2 that describes the way things were meant to be. Now, perhaps you're here this morning and you're not a Christian or you might be a bit skeptical about the Bible or about church, and I get that. Maybe you're just cautiously curious about this whole God thing. And I want to say thank you for coming and and being open to hear what we're talking about here today. But as you consider the relational issues that are showing up in your life, I want to invite you to kind of open yourself up to what we're talking about, what we're going to say, and see if there isn't some resonate, something that resonates there, some, some truth that unfolds. But for those of you who do know the Bible, what is the first bad thing that happens in Scripture? Is it when Cain kills his brother Abel? No. Is it when Adam and Eve give in to temptation and sin? Trick question, it's not. The first bad thing to ever happen in the Bible we see in Genesis 2 verse 18 where God says, it's not good for the man to be alone. The first problem is not sin, it's loneliness, it's disconnection. It's isolation, because that's not how God intended humanity to flourish. And so God says, let us make human beings in our image. God is using plural there because God is community. He says us and our, and that's how he's going to create people. Let us make human beings in our image, make them reflecting our nature God created human beings. He created them godlike, reflecting God's nature. He created them male and female. God blessed them, prosper, reproduce, fill earth, take charge, be responsible for fish in the sea and birds in the air, for every living thing that moves on the face of the earth. And then this poet describing God's plan for humanity goes on and in chapter two tells the same story from a slightly different angle. And he says, the man said, finally, this is when man and woman encounter one another. Finally, bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh, name her woman for she was made from man. Therefore, a man leaves his father and mother and embraces his wife. They become one flesh. Now, what we're seeing here is this symbolic metaphor of God's plan for how people were designed to live. That we would have a name, name her. That we would have a purpose. Take responsibility, take charge, be productive, do something with your life that we would have relationships, that this does not happen alone and in isolation, it happens together in oneness and in community. And most relational problems that we face are because we don't know who we are. We don't know what our name is. We don't know who we are. We don't know why we're here and we don't know who we're meant to be doing life with. That's where so much of the instability and uncertainty and struggle for us comes. But it was not meant to be that way. Here's God's plan, connection with God, that we were meant to reflect God's nature. There would be this relationship between us and God that that every single human being that we see, every one of you, every person on this planet is God-like in nature, is an image bearer of God, is carrying a reflection of God with them. Oh man, that's beautiful. When we listen to this song, This Is Me, she says, for we are glorious. Yes, that's how it was meant to be. We are meant to be glorious. That we would have connection with God, connection with each other. And I love the imagery here of this relationship between man and woman. Because they are joined at the hip, side by side. Flesh of my flesh, bone of my bone. There's a physical partnership. There's a spiritual partnership. There's, a, there's a, 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 an emotional partnership between them. Partnership, not hierarchy, not powering up on one another, but, but oneness. 
And then there's connection to our divine purpose that God gives us. Prosper, reproduce, be creative, make things, go places, be responsible. And this whole beautiful picture of human thriving is concluded with this phrase that I love because this is our hope. This is where we get hope of what God's intention for us is. It's Genesis 2 verse 20. The two of them, the man and his wife, were naked but felt no shame. They were completely vulnerable with each other. This is me. This is who I am. And you know what? I have nothing to hide from you. I'm not ashamed who I am of who I am, I'm worthy of love, I'm worthy of belonging, I'm wholehearted, this is me. Can you see it? No shame. So what happened? What went wrong? Where did the hiding and the blaming and the covering up and the pretending come from? When Adam and Eve chose to say to this intention, this design, this plan God laid out for them, they said, no, actually, we think we know better. Actually, we think we can, can, can get there a different way. When they chose their way over God's way, this is what unfolded. Immediately, Genesis 2 tells us, the two of them did see what's really going on, saw themselves naked, it's like suddenly they saw each other as flawed, as vulnerable, maybe even weak. They sewed fig leaves together to make as makeshift clothes for themselves. They started to hide their true selves from one another. They started to put up the facade. When they heard the sound of God strolling in the garden in the evening breeze, the man and his wife hid in the trees of the garden, hid from God. There it is, guys, and so many of us are still doing that. We hide from God, we hold him at arm's length. We feel like if we show up, if God finds us, what happens? God called to the man, where are you? He said, I heard you in the garden and I was afraid. Fear comes in because I was naked, because you would see me as I am with all my mistakes and all my flaws, and I hid. And so suddenly, from open-hearted, vulnerable, connected with God, walking free without shame, in communion, in purpose, in belonging, humanity finds themselves hiding from God, blaming and shaming, utterly disconnected, and where so many of us find ourselves today. We know what that feels like. We know what shame feels like because it's what makes those who have been abused keep quiet if they know. It's what makes those who abuse others hide and cover up and deny. Shame is what makes us cheat and lie and hustle and hurt and numb and run away from our realities in a million different ways. And all of that damages us and hurts us. And so the cycle continues. And shame says to us in our darkest, weakest moments, who do you think you are? Oof, they could see you now. You'll never be enough. How do we live free? How do we live shamelessly? Well, if we want to live a shameless life, a selfless life, a free life. The antidote to shame is empathy. Now, empathy is a word that we can sometimes get mixed up with sympathy. And sympathy is actually, it's quite a discouraging thing. You know, sympathy is when someone's like, oh, shame. Mm. You know, sucks to be you. Have you ever been on the receiving end of someone's well-meaning sympathy, but it's so not what you needed? You know, you're like, oh, guys, my kid was sick this weekend. Oh, well, at least you have a kid. Hmm? You know, people who silver line your problems and make it feel less than. Yo, I'm having a hard time with Tom. Well, at least you married. 
at least. Man, sympathy is when someone observes us from a distance and feels sorry for us and pities us. And sympathy can so often, even though we give it in, with good intention and we might mean well, but it can be quite insensitive and it can actually drive disconnection. Because I'm not going to show up to you and say I'm having a hard time when you tell me, well, at least you've got this. Oh, there goes the disconnection. There goes the shame. Oh, I better not tell them what's really going on in my life. That's embarrassing. No, no, everything's fine. Tom is awesome and he never makes any mistakes. <laughs> Sympathy rarely helps get rid of shame, but empathy has a powerful difference because what empathy does, empathy puts us in someone else's shoes. Empathy says, oh, that's hard for you? Me too. I also struggle with that. Empathy is non-judgmental because empathy comes in and says, hey, let me see your world from your angle. Let me look at this issue from your perspective. What's going on for you here? What gets rid of shame is empathy because empathy says, oh yeah, I get it. That's really hard. Empathy says, you know what, you're not alone. I, I don't know what it's like to experience that, but I do know what loss feels like. And you find that common ground. Empathy builds connection because it's someone who says to you, you know what, I don't know why this is happening to you in your life, and it really sucks, but you know what, I'm here with you. Empathy is when we put ourselves in someone else's shoes and we choose to experience what they're experiencing and feel what they feel without judgment, without criticism, and oh, that restores connection. That restores connection. A few years ago, I was at a baby shower and I was sitting next to a friend of mine who I knew at, at the time was really struggling to fall pregnant. They'd had several miscarriages. Their marriage was taking strain because of this pressure. And, and, and the awkward thing was I had just had a baby. And we were sitting there and there was just this unspoken tension because that's what shame does. Shame makes us avoid saying what needs to be said. Shame makes us kind of hide and pretend. And we're sitting next to each other and, and it's awkward and there's like this big elephant in the room, um, it, not the pregnant lady, she, the elephant is the shame, not, I could have found a different metaphor there. Okay, so the, anyway, we're sitting there and it is, it's like cringy, you know? And I don't know, I had this moment and I, said, and I looked over and I said, friend, how are these baby showers for you? What's it like for you? And she turned to me with such relief and she said, Jess, it is so hard. It's so hard. She said, I mean, I come because I love my friends and I want to be excited for them, but it's actually really painful. And we sat and we chatted about it and I just kind of listened to her talk. And at the end of the conversation, she, she turned to me and she was like, Jess, no one's ever asked me that question before. Thank you. And we went from an awkwardly knowing what's going on but not saying anything to connection, to friendship, to a hug, to, to us both seeing each other, seeing one another. Because the antidote to shame is empathy that it's not good for man to be alone thing, that connection is not okay and isolation is not okay and loneliness is not okay. It's brought back into how it's meant to be through empathy. And in fact, when you look through scripture with the lens of empathy, you see it all over the place. Paul writes this to a church in Galatia and it's a brilliant description of empathy. He says, live creatively, friend. In other words, hey, don't just go with what comes automatically. Think about this. Work at this. Live creatively. If someone falls into sin, if someone makes a mistake, forgivingly restore them, saving your critical comments for yourself. You might be needing forgiveness before the day is out. You see, empathy says, you know what? I also struggle. You're not the only one who's messed up. I've messed up too. Stoop down and reach out to those who are oppressed. Empathy is instead of standing there and looking down and going, oh, shame, it sucks for you down there. 
Empathy is, no, you know what? I'm going to get down here. I'm going to stoop down. I'm going to get into your shoes. I'm going to see what's going on from your angle, from your perspective. Share their burdens and so complete the law of Christ. Jesus said, love one another. This is what it looks like. If you think you're too good for that, you are badly deceived. There's that lie. There is that lie that so often we live out of, which is, you know what, I'm too good to say, to acknowledge, to put it out there that everything's not okay. And so it drives the disconnection between those who know we're not okay and watch us pretending that we are. The antidote to shame is to forgive instead of to resent, to save our critical comments for ourselves, to stoop down instead of look down, to reach out instead of shut out, to share their burdens instead of add to their burdens and to humble ourselves. That restores connection, that heals relationships, that brings people who don't understand each other back into perspective with each other. Empathy restores connection. Now, we found the origin of shame in Scripture. It's there. It's part of the human story. Could we find the origin of empathy there too? Now, I would suggest to you that the greatest living example of empathy is Jesus. I want to share with you a few stories, a few eyewitness accounts of people who wrote these words down in about 30 to 60 AD because they saw Jesus act this way. And it had such an impact on them and the people that were around Jesus that they chose to follow him and say, hey, I, this is it. This is how humans were meant to live. This is what I've been looking for. Imagine meeting someone who did the things that Jesus did and you might start to understand why people follow him and choose to live like him and feel connected to him because he was the greatest example of empathy, restoring us to the connection that we were designed for because Jesus Jesus turned away the self-righteous men who wanted to stone a woman who was caught in a moment of a sexual assault and harassment, and Jesus instead responds to the woman with non-judgment. Jesus is the one who saw a crooked, corrupt, white-collar businessman named Zacchae Zacchaeus, a criminal, and instead of calling him out and shaming him in front of everyone, he goes into his home and has a meal. That's empathy. Jesus is the one who touches the mentally ill person that society has rejected and is repulsed by. Jesus is the one who wept with his friends when their brother died. He knew he was going to raise their brother from the dead. But that was a future reality. Their present reality was a brother who had died. And so he stops and he mourns and he weeps and he grieves with them because he's seeing life from their perspective. Jesus, who sat with the ordinary, questioning, oppressed workers of the day, listening to their wrestles and their struggles. Jesus, the one who showed up at the dinner tables with the academics and the elites, and he looked past their social status, and he saw who they really are. He saw their hearts, and he listened because he looks past behavior and he sees the image of God in every single person. That's Jesus. Jesus who stepped into the shoes of humanity, who said this gap between people and God is not okay. We have to close the gap. We have to restore connection. So for 33 years, he walked in our shoes, experiencing every human experience, joy and suffering and pain and physical fatigue and despair and friendship and love. And then Jesus embodied every single human being's ultimate experience, which was death. He would not turn that down so that he could fully empathize with the weight that we carry in life. And the weight that Jesus bore was not just disconnection from his family and his friends when he died, but an actual tearing apart of himself as he hung on that cross and felt himself ripped apart, separated father from son, that oneness broke on the cross. 
so that Jesus would know what it feels like for us. And then, through the power of empathy, Jesus restored connection by rising up from this deathly disconnection and stepping into wholeness, into restoration, into life being put back to the way it was meant to be, the way it was in the garden, where we know who we are and we know why we're here and we know who we're doing life with and we are free and unashamed. That's what Jesus came to do. The naked, sometimes ugly truth is it that at the root of our parenting or our addictions or our hang-ups and our hurts of our reputations, the way we feel about our future, at the root of that is so often shame. And that's why Jesus came to deal with it, to restore us to God and to each other and to ourselves. So here's the invitation we wanna make to you this morning. Are you ready to come out of hiding? Are you ready to say, I am done with shame, telling me I'm not good enough and I never will be? Are you ready to say, God, I believe you when you say I'm worthy of love and I'm worthy of belonging, not because I'm flawless, but because you're flawless, God. One of the ways that we can respond to this invitation is by taking communion. This juice, this wine that represents Jesus' blood and this bread that represents His body. And we say, you know, Jesus, you lived the life I wanna live. Be in me and help me to live in you because I wanna live free. So while Kadia and the team sing to us, sing the words that God is inviting us to respond to, while those words are sung over us as an invitation, I wanna invite you to come to the tables that are scattered around the room and take the wine and the bread and remind yourself that you are free from shame, that Jesus restores connection and gives us life once again. And I wanna say, I think maybe there's someone in here who feels like they don't deserve to take communion. Maybe the church has told you, you're not worthy of this sacrament, of this ritual. Maybe you're thinking, oh, this is only for the people on the inside. That's not true. Because the invitation of Jesus is everyone is welcome at the table and you show up as you are. That's how we arrive in the presence of God as we are. Let's pray and then you can take communion in your own time. Jesus, it can be hard for us to believe truth over lies when we've heard lies for so very long. And so in this moment, God, we ask that your truth would break through the lies, that you would speak shamelessness over us, that your grace your unearned, undeserved love, that we would receive it and feel it and take it in, literally take it in and find freedom. Thank you for making space for all of us to be worthy and to belong. We ask that in these moments, there would be a new found freedom in who you say we are, your beloved ones your children and so we eat and drink and remember who you are God and what you have done and drink together
invite everybody to close their eyes and this is just a way of drawing your attention inwards to what's going on in your heart and your head to what kind of whisper maybe you could be hearing right now perhaps you've been holding God at arm's length perhaps you've been feeling that you're not worthy Like if they knew, I wouldn't be sitting here today. But you are. And the invitation is to come out of hiding and respond to this generous, freeing love of Jesus that's offered to you as you are right now. So I'm going to pray a prayer. If you want to repeat this along with me, heart, when you're head, you may do that. Then I feel like there's some people here this morning and Jesus is saying, come home. Let's pray. Jesus, thank you for walking 
in my shoes. Thank you that you know me and you love me anyway. I want to live in freedom. I want to live without shame. And so I say yes to you and no to shame. Thank you for this. Thank you for the forgiveness, God. And thank you for your grace. Amen. Amen. I'm going to ask you to stand. And um, I think we also just get a sense that we would love to pray for, for anyone here who, are, are, who is or struggling with relational conflict, relational tension, relational breakdown. And we would love to just pray God's blessing upon you and His Spirit upon you, that you would be filled with the spirit of empathy, which is the antidote to shame. And I just want to say, I mean, um, we don't often get to stand up here together, but, but Jess is one of the people that I know who is the most empathetic people I know. And when I've messed up, which happens very infrequently, but when I do, <laughs> no, that's not true. When, when, when I do... She is one of those people who's never one to just heap more burden on or to say, I told you so. Or, but she shows an incredible empathy towards me and I'm grateful for that. And we would love to just pray for you as well, that you would be able to extend that kind of empathy and love and grace just as the Father has extended it to you. May, may we go out as a church, as families, as a bunch of people who are, who are quick to offer empathy. So let's pray. Father, we just lift up every single person in this place. And at the end of the day, what we drive, what we have, where we live, that stuff really doesn't mean a whole bunch to you. What means a whole bunch to you, Lord, is how we treat one another. You say, this is my commandment. Love one another as I have loved you. And you modeled that love for us. We don't have to question what it's like. It's a sacrificial love. It's an empathy so help us, Lord, to extend forgiveness, to extend grace to those who don't deserve it, to those who've hurt us. And Lord, you know we need, I need your help to do that. And so we pray right now in the name of Jesus, which is the name above all names, for a healing, for a restoration, for a oneness, for a union, for a connection. Your original plan from the very beginning. And we declare that now over every relationship and every life represented here this morning. In Jesus' name. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. Thank you so much. Have a great week and we'll see you next time.